Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Skip Rutherford. I'm Dean of the Clinton School of Public Service. We welcome you today. I'm telling you this is a subject that I read about in a journal uh, and became uh, fascinated with it when I was working for Senator Pryor in traveling Arkansas. We would go to courthouses all over the state and everywhere you would, every one of these courthouses you would see Confederate memorials. And I, and many of them were done by the United Daughters of the Confederacy, led by, by women. And I just wondered how in the world all this happened. I mean, I, I knew there was an organization, but, but it was a powerful organization because uh, you saw these all over. And um, I, I was interested enough, but, 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 but quite frankly, didn't pursue it when I became dean of the Clinton School and went to the MacArthur Military Museum and realized that Little Rock's largest convention was a reunion of Confederate veterans. And those veterans arrived at this train station. Trains came every 15 minutes uh, unloading veterans. It was a great display at the MacArthur Military Museum. Uh, and M.M. Cones, the big department store at the time, sold replicas of Confederate uniforms. This was in the early 1900s, I think 1911. Um, and there was a tent city in Little Rock, and it still is the city's largest convention ever. So with those two things in the back of my mind, knowing that every time I walked out that door of the train station, realizing that some 100 years ago, approximately, Trains were coming every 15 minutes unloading people for a reunion. I was reading in a journal and I read about Carrie Janney's book uh, about the role of women in Memorial Day. Southern women after the war who went into the north to battlefields uh, removed the bodies of the Confederate soldiers, or with a team, they didn't actually, but they hired people, brought the bodies back home to the South for, for proper burial. In Virginia alone, over 72,000 bodies brought back and, and reburied in Virginia. Happened all over the South. Carrie is an assistant professor at Purdue. She specializes in U.S. and women gender history, Civil War, Reconstruction, Memory, and Southern Studies. Her book, Burying the Dead But Not the Past, Ladies' Memorial Associations and the Lost Cause, was published by the University of North Carolina Press. She's working on a second book to examine how the Civil War has been remembered between 1865 and 1920. And that's when all those memorials surfaced, and I lobbied her to get those in the book, by the way. Uh, she is particularly interested in how race, gender, and combat experience shaped the ways in which Americans thought about the Civil War and its legacy. One of the most fascinating stories about the role of women. Would you welcome Carrie Janney? Thank you all so much for having me this afternoon. This is my first trip to Arkansas, and I am very excited to be here. So today I'm going to talk to you about the Ladies Memorial Associations, and I will often refer to them as LMAs. Let me stop and say that I'm not talking LMA. Someone stopped me once and asked me who LMA was. It's not a name, LMA, the Ladies Memorial Associations. Point it. There we go. All right, so in my professorial mode, I'll give you an idea of what we're going to talk about today. We're going to start with the establishment of the Ladies Memorial Associations. Then we'll talk about the major contributions. I'm not going to be able to see my notes at all. <laughs> there we go. Great, thank you. I will talk about their major contributions, which were the establishment of Confederate national cemeteries 
and Memorial Day. We can thank the ladies for Memorial Day as we know it today. Then I'll talk about why it was important that women took the role, took the lead in these early memorial activities. And finally, the long-term consequences or contributions, rather, of the Ladies' Memorial Associations. So let's start in April 1865. The Civil War, as I'm sure most of you know, had left Virginia as well as most of the South socially, economically, politically destroyed. Cities from Richmond to Atlanta throughout the South had been left in ruins. Here's a, a great picture of Richmond in 1865. Railroads had been destroyed, major cities left in ruins, farms and fields destroyed, even if a friendly army had been in your vicinity, more than likely your uh, fences had been taken down, your farmland was in ruin. But the human toll of the war was even greater. In the South alone, 260,000 Confederate soldiers died. That's about 25% of the white male southern population in the South. Most of these soldiers had not received what would then have been called proper burials, meaning that they were instead buried on the fields where they had died. This is a picture near Chancellorsville at the Alsop's house. You can see the soldier being buried there on the field. Uh, this is another famous picture uh, from Gettysburg, soldiers again being buried on the fields. Most of them would have been left in mass or unidentified graves. And when farmers returned to their activities in the spring of 1865, when they turned back to plant their corn and wheat again, many of them came across scenes like this. This is from Cold Harbor, just north of Richmond, Virginia, where uh, bones would have been protruding from the ground. And that was the case in May of 1865 in Winchester, Virginia, when a woman named Mary Williams was upset. A farmer had come to her and told her that he had accidentally plowed up the remains of several Confederate soldiers while he was preparing his land for corn. So Mary went to her sister-in-law, a woman by the name of Eleanor Williams Boyd, and they decided that the women in the community needed to do something about this. So they called a meeting. They called a meeting of all the women in the town who had volunteered during the war in the Soldiers' Aid Society. So women who had sewn tents and haversacks or who had volunteered at the local hospital. And they decided that what this group of women would do was first they would collect the dead from a radius of 12 to 15 miles around the town of Winchester. Next, they would inter them in one cemetery, a Confederate cemetery, so they're going to have to purchase land for the cemetery. And finally, if all of that succeeded, they hoped that they could establish an annual tradition of honoring those dead. They would call themselves the Ladies Memorial Association of Winchester. Now this is May 1865, less than a month after General Lee had surrendered his troops at Appomattox. And here we have the first Ladies Memorial Association in the South forming, the first in Virginia as well. Within two years, by 1868, at least 24 other organizations in Virginia would form uh, with a membership somewhere around 1,100 women. In the next couple of years, somewhere between 70 and 100 of these associations would form throughout the South. It's hard to get a clear number because these are independent organizations that may have existed for a few years in some spots and then faded away. So nevertheless, we have these uh, ladies' associations forming. Now this afternoon, I hope to demonstrate to you that these ladies' memorial associations were not merely sentimental organizations who were there to mourn the loss of their loved ones in the wake of a war. Rather, that they offered a political response to both Confederate defeat and the onset of Reconstruction. Through their work, through the work of these ladies, they allowed ex-Confederates to subtly resist Reconstruction while also honoring their dead. And white Southern men and women alike realized that these ladies, and that is how they refer to themselves, might use gender in the interest of Confederate politics. Protected by their gender, white women were able to escape charges of treason during Reconstruction and to construct an expression of Confederate mourning that would be acceptable to Republicans and the larger Northern populace. So it was middle and upper class women of the LMAs who served in the forefront in the post-war battle over how the Civil War would be remembered, thereby initiating, inaugurating 
the lost cause as early as 1865 and 1866. So the summer of 1865, these ladies in Winchester, Virginia, were meeting every so many weeks at, at the home of Eleanor Boyd. And their primary work during that summer was to locate and then keep a record of all of the Confederate graves. Well, they quickly realized this was going to take a lot of money. And they didn't have the money to complete the work on their own. After all, the cemetery wasn't for local boys from Winchester. It wasn't for Virginia boys in general. Rather, this cemetery was to be for all Confederate soldiers from throughout the South who had died on fields near uh, Winchester. So they issued appeals. Uh, these would be sent out through newspapers, and they also printed thousands of copies of broadsides describing the destruction of Virginia's Shenandoah Valley. Let me just read you a little bit from one of the appeals. It said that, the, quote, the dead were generally buried where they fell, and their rude graves are fast disappearing beneath the feet of men and beasts. We are therefore induced to appeal to you for aid in this matter, encouraged by the belief that you will feel it a privilege as well as a duty to pay this tribute of respect to the memory of those who fell in your cause. Well, despite the poverty of the post-war South, money begins to pour in from across the former Confederacy. By the spring of 1866, the ladies had received $14,000 in contributions. Uh, 1,200 of that from Alabama alone. Alabama had lost a good many young men in the Winchester vicinity. The ladies then used this money to purchase five acres for a Confederate cemetery adjacent to the town cemetery. And even though Stonewall Jackson was not buried there, he was buried in Lexington, Virginia, just up the valley, they decided that, in fact, they would name their cemetery after their favorite Confederate hero, General Stonewall Jackson. By the spring of 1866, 2,489 Confederate soldiers had been reinterred, including 829 unknown, all of them arranged by state within this Confederate cemetery. Well, you may be wondering about all of those Union soldiers, the Federal soldiers, who died in the South as well. Because keep in mind, with the exceptions of Gettysburg and uh, Antietam, almost every Civil War engagement had, in fact, occurred in the South, 620,000 soldiers dying in the war. Well, in the summer and fall of 1865, thousands upon thousands of Union soldiers still remained in the South in these unmarked, generally mass graves. And with the war over, the northern public began to demand that the remains of these soldiers be cared for as well. In the winter of 1866, Congress finally authorized funds for a massive reburial project. February of that year, the U.S. Burial Corps arrived in Richmond, Virginia to gather the remains first of northern prisoners who had died at prisoner of war camps, and then it would move on throughout the state. They would create federal cemeteries this is a picture I should mention of Fredericksburg, Virginia, where they are, you can see them disinterring soldiers uh, from the, uh, this is near the Bloody Lane, just below Marie's Heights in Fredericksburg. Fredericksburg, Richmond, everywhere else, they're going to create national cemeteries, just as they had done at Gettysburg. These cemeteries would be arranged by state. Every grave would be of equal importance, no grave more important than any other. There'd be a section left for the unknown and a central section left where eventually a monument could be raised. Well, now, of course, the U.S. Burial Corps is only interested in burying the federal dead. After all, why would they spend their money and resources burying the rebel dead? And this, this union practice of ignoring and neglecting the Confederate dead was one of the primary catalysts for the development of Ladies Memorial Associations in the Confederacy or the former Confederacy, excuse me, in the spring of 1866. So throughout Virginia, residents become increasingly angry about the lack of provisions for Confederate graves. If you read newspapers from this period, you'll see countless uh, just rages about why the Union Burial Corps is ne neglecting the Confederate dead. They say, hey, you're saying we never left the Union in the first place. You should provide graves for our soldiers. There's never any dispute about this among the federal government. They say, of course, we're not going to bury the rebel dead. So the, the Confederacy wants to, or the former Confederacy wants to provide some sort of proper burial. But remember, there's no Confederate government to do this. 
The state governments are now under provisional governors appointed by President Andrew Johnson. They're not going to risk using their funds to bury the rebel dead. And former Confederates realized, as one Lynchburg newspaper put it, that memorial tributes from, quote, the gentle hand of woman would be less threatening to the federal government than former Confederate veterans. A fitting work lies before the ladies, the paper wrote in April 1866, concluding that we doubt not that they will do it well and promptly. So women in communities near battlefields, places like Winchester or Fredericksburg, or those near where large hospital complexes had been, Richmond, Lynchburg, for example, heralded the call. Lynchburg's women responded in April of 1866, 40 women who had volunteered at the local hospital, the Confederate hospital during the war, formally transformed their organization into a memorial society. The women in Richmond formed three separate organizations, the Oakwood Memorial Association, the Hollywood Memorial Association, and the Hebrew Memorial Association, dedicated specifically for those Jewish soldiers that they thought uh, the other uh, memorial associations would neglect. And we're not just talking 10 women here or there that join these organizations. Remember, there are three different groups in Virginia's capital city. The Churchill women uh, that form the Oakwood Association, there are 328 of them who come out on the first night that there's a meeting called. So this is, this is a large response. Uh, throughout the rest of the spring, organizations form throughout the rest of the state, as well as uh, places like Raleigh, North Carolina, Savannah, Georgia. Now you might be asking, who were these women? Why, how did they have the time, the resources, any of that to join this effort? Well, most of them had been active during the war. They had been members of soldiers' aid societies where they had uh, darned socks or made uh, tents and uniforms for the soldiers. Some of them had served as nurses during the Civil War. Theoretically, though, any woman was welcome to join the association. All you had to do was be able to pay a subscription or pay dues. And this ranged anywhere from 50 cents annually to 50 cents per month. So overwhelmingly, most of these women are elite women. Their husbands were businessmen, civic leaders, physicians, and for some odd reason, overwhelmingly, they were the wives or daughters of lawyers. But there were two very surprising traits that I found. I started going through the membership roles of all of these women and, and looking at, at the census records. And two things struck me that were very odd. First, many of these women, their husbands and or brothers, did not, did not serve in the Confederate Army. Now, that doesn't mean they didn't support the Confederate war effort. Some of them had husbands that served in the Confederate legislature. Many of them had husbands that were ministers in town. Some of them were simply too old to join the Confederate service. So many of them had husbands that did not serve in the Confederate army. The second surprising fact was when they had relatives who did serve in the Confederate army, they did not die during the Civil War. Uh, for example, Major General William Mahone of Petersburg, the famous Petersburg crater. His wife was a vice president of the Petersburg Association. So these women then were not grieving for their own kin. As the uh, constitution of one of the organizations put it, quote, a deep and living sympathy for bereaved families had motivated them. You'll notice they don't say our bereaved families. So what's the relevance of this? These women are not widows. They're not orphans. Their mourning is not of a personal nature. But they were mourning. They were mourning the loss of their cause. They were mourning the loss of the Confederate nation. So through their work, through the creation of these cemeteries and Memorial Days, as we'll talk about in just a minute, this work allowed them to continue to show their devotion, their patriotism, if you will, to the Confederacy, even though the Confederate state no longer existed. So it was patriotic devotion, rather than mere sentimentalism, that motivated these women's actions. So how did they do it? How did they organize these Confederate cemeteries? Well, I should point out that these women, these are middle and upper class women. They are not literally out there on the fields digging up the bodies themselves. But what they did do was organize the community. They would ask community members to let them know 
about graves that have been found in, in town. In Fredericksburg, for example, there was a ledger in the local drugstore. And if you came across remains, you were to write that down in the ledger. Then a committee of women would hire men who would go out and do the labor. Often these were former slaves or other working class men in town who would go do the, the work. Women might ride along with them out to the fields to supervise this work. An Alabama man searching for the remains of his brother in Fredericksburg wrote this account that I'd like to read to you. He said, before the work of the removal was done, every Confederate grave in the whole country was marked by a stake made of locust and on which the numbers were burnt. When this was being done, all information that could be found about each grave was carefully recorded in a book together with the number of the grave. When the remains were taken up, they were placed in boxes about three and a half to four feet long. And as soon as each box was closed, it was numbered the same as the stake which established at the grave. The boxes then were transported, transported to the Confederate Cemetery at Fredericksburg, where they were laid into the newly dug graves, making sure that the box numbers corresponded with the number on the stake. Then all of the material, all the documentation, would be turned over to the ladies, and they would be in charge of the, uh, maintaining the records. Now, these women were very conscious of the fact that they were not creating local cemeteries, they were not creating state cemeteries, but they were creating national Confederate cemeteries, just like what had been created at Gettysburg, just like the Union Burial Corps was doing in their midst. Most Civil War soldiers, whether Northern or Southern, did not, their bodies were not returned home after the war, cost being one of the major reasons for this. Instead, just like needs to warm up, I guess. Just like the uh, northern uh, cemeteries, Confederate national cemeteries were laid out by state. This is the Spotsylvania Cemetery, a, a small little cemetery, but you can see each state that was represented on the battlefield had its own section. There was a section left for the unknown and a section left in the center where some central monument could be erected. Uh, battle, or cemeteries tended to be close to battlefields. After all, that's where the remains were. And the Fredericksburg ladies suggested that the battlefield in their city, where Confederates had won a tremendous victory over northern forces, was the most appropriate location for a southern cemetery. They said that they could, quote, think of no spot so appropriate for the last resting place of these heroes than the commanding eminence overlooking the memorable plain of Fredericksburg. So if Gettysburg was to be hollowed ground for Union soldiers, Fredericksburg, the site of a major Confederate victory, would likewise be hallowed ground for Confederate soldiers. So by creating these Confederate national cemeteries, and this is a very early version of Oakwood Cemetery, which is in Richmond. I was close to Shimborazo Hospital, one of the largest hospital complexes during the war. You can see the rude headboards that were erected in 1865. But by completing these national Confederate cemeteries, the ladies hoped to create physical reminders of the Confederates of the Confederacy for future generations. The Hollywood Association in Richmond, for example, believed that their cemetery would become, in their words, a mecca for future generations. They said that it would annually attract, quote, pilgrim widows and orphans, fathers and mothers, brothers and sisters, relatives and friends from every southern state. Let our children grow up to foster it, making this sacred spot more and more attractive each succeeding year worthy of being the deposit of our heart's love, honor, and gratitude. So this is very, very conscious on their part. This is meant to physically change, to alter the landscape so that you can lower a Confederate battle flag. You can't take away a Confederate cemetery that looks like this. But equally as important was the tradition that these women started, the tradition of Memorial Day, started by Ladies Memorial Associations in Virginia and throughout the South. Now, Memorial Days were absolutely a political statement. This past Memorial Day, there was some dispute about people marching in Washington, D.C., and whether or not Memorial Day was supposed to be a political event. Well, in fact, Memorial Day was a political event from its very founding in 1866. It provided opportunities for thousands of ex-Confederate ex soldiers to gather in a central location and pay homage to their lost cause. Now, Memorial Day dates varied by location. 
They always were in the spring, but each community could choose its own date. For example, many communities in Virginia chose May 10th. That was the day Stonewall Jackson had finally succumbed to his wounds. Uh, Richmond women chose May 31st because they said that was the day in 1861 that they had first heard the gunshots of war. Other places, uh, especially deeper in the South, chose April 26th. That was the day General Johnston had finally surrendered his troops. So it varied from place to place. There was not a single Confederate Memorial Day. But regardless, Memorial Days tended to look the same no matter what day they occurred on. Citizens would gather at some central location in town, maybe the courthouse square or maybe a church in town. Then they would march in procession to the cemetery where women and children had already decorated the graves. Here's an early Confederate uh, Memorial Day service. You can see they've used evergreen and other uh, decorations to, to facilitate this day. Then, once everyone arrived at the cemetery, speakers, men who had been chosen by a committee of the Ladies Memorial Association, would deliver prayers and speeches, and perhaps there'd be a musical selection, perhaps Dixie or something of that nature would play. Here we have people, uh, the ladies at the grave of Stonewall Jackson in Lexington, Virginia. White Southerners, male and female, realized how very, very dangerous these early Memorial Day services were. On Lynchburg's first Memorial Day, May 10th, 1866, the city newspaper noted that the services would, quote, doubtless excite harsh and malignant remarks in certain quarters of the North and be taken as evidence of a mutinous, malcontent spirit pervading our people. Well, he was right. Many Northerners did attack these so-called floral tributes. The editor of the New York Times said that Southern spirit grew rapidly through the women's efforts. The Chicago Tribune denounced the women of Virginia for placing flowers on the graves of Confederate dead, charging that these women, quote, sought to keep alive the political feeling of hostility to the Union. But the ever savvy ex-Confederates defended their actions. They said that they were, quote, the spontaneous tributes of mothers and daughters, even though they'd spent months and a year planning these activities. And they believed that women's gender protected them against Northern retaliation. Men might be arrested for treason. Women, however, would not. And men took advantage of this perception to criticize Reconstruction and the federal government as well as to praise the fallen Confederacy. Let me provide you two examples of how this all worked, both of these being from Winchester, Virginia. Winchester's first Memorial Day, June 6th, 1866. Men again are going to argue that their day was free from treasonous behavior. Thousands of people fill this very small town. First there's a procession that will form, form at the local Episcopal Church at 11 o'clock that morning. Uh, included in the procession were survivors of Stonewall Jackson's uh, 33rd Virginia, survivors of Elsie's Brigade, a delegation from Baltimore, 14 girls in white with black sashes representing the 13 Confederate states plus Maryland, and they're wearing the black sashes because they're in mourning, of course. The LMA, soldiers in general, youths, vehicles, and those on horseback. This is from the local paper. Uh, women and children had already decorated the cemetery prior to the arrival, and the crowd gathered to hear speakers. This is June 1866. All three former Confederate majors pay tribute to the lost cause. Now, what's incredible about this story is that the Northern, the Union Burial Corps is right across the street. They're creating a Union, a national cemetery, literally right across the street from this. And northern troops should have frowned at what was going on as this large group of southern sympathizers gathers to mingle. Well, the men consciously frame the day's activities within the domestic sphere of women. One of the speakers, Major Uriel Wright, pointed out that, quote, the mothers and daughters of Virginia are the chief mourners and actors in these touching services. And he claimed that this noble enterprise was the work of Virginia's mothers and daughters, not the veterans. He argued that Memorial Day had not been created by politicians or schemers 
seeking individual distinction or plotting the renewal of strife. Rather, he held, Memorial Day celebrations could be interpreted as only true and pure because they had been born in the heart of woman. Like many of his contemporaries, he said that women were naturally, quote, disinterested in politics, and therefore their motives must be pure. So these women were not acting as agitators against the US government. Well, if you ask me, he protested just a little bit too much. And if you don't think that's the case, then let's fast forward to October of 1866. The ladies had decided that it wasn't enough that their cemetery was named after Stonewall Jackson. They actually needed a legitimate Confederate general in their cemetery. So they decided that they would disinter Turner Ashby. He had been buried at the University of Virginia during the war. They would disinter him as well as his brother and move them north to Winchester, Virginia. Well, all of this takes place, very elaborate ceremony. There's an elaborate coffin that's paid for by the women of Jefferson County West Virginia, it's the area right around Harper's Ferry. Uh, There's a black walnut coffin with silver fringe and platings. Incredibly expensive coffin, nonetheless, for someone whose bones you're digging up and transporting. The bodies were moved to Charlestown, West Virginia, and then on to Winchester. Now, that part of the, the service, they had a hearse drawn by four white horses, accompanied by 60 former military officers and local officials winding down through the Shenandoah Valley. How could this have looked like anything else but a military parade? Well, on the day of the services, Thursday, October 25th, 1866, 20,000 Valley residents, as well as other guests, arrived for the reburial services. Trains had come in from Baltimore, as well as from North Carolina. So this is not just a local event. This is a multi-state event. Again, the women had decorated the graves. But their activities, again, provided a forum now for former Virginia governor, Henry Wise. He had been the governor when uh, John Brown was hanged in 1859. It was his turn to speak. And he spoke neither of mourning nor of reconciliation. But instead, he encouraged the crowd to look to the dead for strength in dealing with surrender and submission. He told them to ask themselves what the mighty Stonewall would do in their situation. Would he have praised proclamations of peace, peace, when there is no peace, he yelled? Would he not have demanded as lawful the rights of withdrawal of the military force and the Freedmen's Bureau and the restoration of civil rule and the writ of habeas corpus? Wright went on to proclaim that Jackson would have never disavowed the cause for which his comrades had died. And finally, and keep in mind, we, we do know that the Federal Burial Corps is literally watching this from across the street. He yells, a lost cause. If lost, it was false. If true, it is not lost. So under the direction of these ladies, Memorial Days and reinterment ceremonies provided legitimate venues for ex-Confederate veterans and ex-Confederate politicians to march into towns, for thousands of white Southerners to gather in a central location, and for former generals and political figures to praise the Confederate cause in a political forum. 2008 was not the first time that Memorial Day had been politicized. So what in the world were those federal troops thinking across the street? Well, unfortunately, we don't know what they were thinking. But we do know that by the fall of 1866, Union authorities had begun restricting expressions of Confederate sympathy across the South. In 1867, and you'll remember that 1867 is the year the Reconstruction Acts uh, were finally passed and the South is split up into five military districts. The Union commander in Memphis, Tennessee, refused to allow any processions, speeches, or Memorial Day activities. Raleigh, North Carolina was prohibited from having processions for five years. In New Orleans, under the military command of General Philip H. Sheridan, uh, this city experienced some of the harshest constraints. The general forbade city uh, residents from participating in fundraising endeavors for monuments and broke up organizations that had been uh, created to support Confederate widows and orphans. Uh, he even issued a statement saying that the word Confederate could no longer be used, and so the Ladies' Confederate Memorial Association simply dropped Confederate from their name. Now, in Virginia, there seems to have been no official crackdown. General Schofield was the commanding general of military district number one. 
and he seemed to have been a little bit milder. But what did happen was there was a voluntary curtailment by the ladies themselves. Uh, several associations had no services that spring. Others decided that they would have no procession to the cemetery or they would have no speakers at the cemetery, but they would still gather there to place flowers on the graves. At Richmond's largest cemetery, the Hollywood Memorial Association, and I should say eventually there were 18,000 Confederate dead buried in Hollywood, there was no procession that day, no speeches, but 60,000 people showed up to place flowers on the graves in 1867. Uh, one local resident noted that even without the parades and speeches, quote, if the affair had not been under the control of the ladies, then a thousand bayonets would have bristled to prevent the celebration. So even people then recognized how very much politically motivated all of this was. Well, we don't have time to continue with a detailed discussion of what these ladies did for the next 40 years or so, but I thought I'd give you the, the fast version. And one is that they continued to sponsor Memorial Day celebrations. They continued, or they began the process of building monuments. One of the first monuments was in Richmond, the Hollywood Pyramid erected here. This is a, a massive pyramid if you've never seen it in person. The symbolism behind this was great. The lady said that this was limestone from the James River that was to represent the, the solid bedrock commitment of Confederate men, and they hoped that roses would be planted along the base that would creep up and show the tender devotion of Southern women to the cause. So the first uh, monuments would be placed in cemeteries because of the mourning nature. Eventually they would be placed in more public places like the famous Lee Monument in Virginia, in Richmond, uh, dedicated in 1890. Uh, the women were central to getting this monument erected, even though people like General Jubal Early tried to fight them all the way. He, he didn't think it was appropriate that women would be commanding an effort to honor his former chieftain, General Lee. They also began efforts to educate. This was a, a predecessor of the United Daughters of the Confederacy who formed in 1894. Just prior to that, the women the, of the LMAs turned their attention to education. They start try to restore the White House of the Confederacy in Richmond, Virginia. They make that into a museum. And then they try to restore Blandford Church in Petersburg. This church, they wanted to be a Confederate shrine. And so they had Thomas, uh, excuse me, Lewis Comfort Tiffany design these 15 absolutely amazing Tiffany windows uh, to be placed in the church. There's uh, 14 states are represented every state uh, but Kentucky that sent troops to fight in the Confederacy. There, he also donated a window for the Ladies Memorial Association. So those are some of the activities that they've continued to do. So what did the ladies accomplish? Well, they created those national Confederate cemeteries. They, of course, established the tradition of Memorial Day. They began the process of building monuments. The reason that we have monuments in every southern town now is largely due to the early work of these ladies associations. They collected relics and began the establishment of museums. They literally, in many cases, gave birth to the United Daughters of the Confederacy, the most popular and visible of Confederate heritage associations. And most importantly, they perpetuated a sense of Confederate identity and transmitted it to the next generation. Today, there appear to be only two ladies memorial associations left one in Petersburg, Virginia, and one in Fredericksburg, Virginia. And when I started my research, they didn't even know that the other still existed. They've become so insular. Both groups, though, are still dedicated to Confederate Memorial Day. They still sponsor their own Confederate Memorial Day. And they are both responsible for their respective cemeteries in their cities. And just to wrap up, even though the Ladies Memorial Associations have declined today in both numbers and visibility, I believe their history remains imperative for us to understand the origins and the trajectory of Southern white women's efforts on behalf of both their local communities and the larger community of ex-Confederates. In the immediate aftermath of the Civil War, in the years when Confederate spirit might have been quashed by federal officials, it had been the women 
who sponsored these elaborate Confederate tributes, women who staged these symbolic rituals, providing a forum for men to expound on the political legitimacy of secession or the perceived injustices of Reconstruction. It had been women in their cloak of feminine mourning and weakness who had triumphed in their efforts to fashion a positive memory of the defeated Confederacy, and they created permanent reminders of the lost cause through their cemetery and monument efforts. It had been the women of these ladies' monument memorial associations who created permanent reminders of the Confederacy through their uh, projects, thus initiating the cult of the lost cause. Thank you all very much. Okay, any questions? God has questions. Yes, sir. Yes. You mentioned that there were 250,000 Confederate dead. Mm -hmm. uh, roughly, what was the, the, the ratio of wounded to killed in the conflict? Two thirds. Two thirds? Mm hmm. So many, many, many more men who are going home with one eye or empty sleeves. I mean, so basically you've got a huge population of invalid men. That's right. I would think that would be a, quite a, a, you know. You think they should have devoted their efforts to that instead no, of rebuilding the dead? No, I just think that, you know, I was wondering if you know, the social structure of the, child, of the South wants to change pretty considerably just, just due to that fact. Due to the... To the number of invalids? Yes. Absolutely. Uh, one of the things that happens, and maybe this isn't exactly what you're, you're getting at, but it becomes more socially acceptable to be a widow or to be a spinster among Southern women. We know that the rates of uh, widowhood and women who remain single uh, grow exponentially after the Civil War. But absolutely, you know, that's something that scholars really haven't done enough work with yet, are those invalid soldiers who come home. And many of them die within a few years, within 10 years or so after the war because of their injuries, especially if they had um, gut injuries and things of that nature. Sarah? Hi, I'm Sarah from Wolfram. I'm a student here at the Clinton School. I was wondering if you've done any research in comparing the women that have come out against the war now to mm -hmm. these women, so Cindy Sheehan or the grandmothers against the war, and their gender roles in terms of... I haven't. I haven't at all, but you know, this has been a, a pervasive issue in women's history. If you look at women and their relationship to war, and then the stories that are told about women in the post-war period. One of the most fascinating things about the Civil War to me is the way that we emphasize the role of Southern white women, the role they played in the Civil War, and yet we forget the contributions both for and against the war effort that happened among Northern women. But no, I haven't looked at contemporary issues, but that's a fantastic point you raise. Yes, um, hi, I'm Ashley Davis. I'm also a Clinton School student. Um, my question is, how do you, or what do you see is the public perception of these uh, LMAs that are still in existence? The two that you mentioned, how much participation is there in these Confederate Memorial Days? What's the public attitude now <laughs> towards continuing to memorialize the, the opposition, I guess? Well, the United Daughters of the Confederacy are the ones right. who really have the reputation and for good or, or ill, and that's because they are just so much more visible. The LMAs, in many ways, have not had a bad reputation, so to speak, because they have become so invisible to the larger public. People just don't even know that they exist. In Fredericksburg, for example, it's limited now to 20 women, and it's a hereditary organization. When I was teaching at the University of Virginia, one of my students said, oh, my mother's in that organization, and I get to be in it when I'm old enough. And this just stunned me that it was a hereditary. The Petersburg Association, on the other hand, is primarily dedicated to restoring and, and maintaining the Blandford Church. And unlike the United Daughters of the Confederacy, where you have to prove your heritage in order to be a member, you have to prove that you had an uh, ancestor who fought for the Confederacy, anyone can join the Petersburg Association. And a self-proclaimed Yankee was very excited to tell me that she had joined this association because she saw it as a preservation society. So they simply don't have the same type of negative stereotypes because they haven't been involved in the flag debates and things of that nature. Now, if they were more visible, I, I, I don't think there's a lot separating them from the UDC. I found it interesting when you were talking about after the war, the way the federal government chose to react to burying mm -hmm. settlements. Mm -hmm. How does that play out? I mean, I know they don't have $700 billion, to, but money was an issue, but it just kind of struck me as, um, 
it kind of it made me a little angry with my government that they chose to not bury the Confederate well, dead. I mean, at this time, weren't they trying to bring the government? Weren't they trying to bring the two together? Isn't that kind of a and and that's the argument that ex-Confederates or white Southerners use is that aren't we headed toward reconciliation? Isn't this about reunion? But in many ways, I mean, that's the one example where the federal government, that and pensions, where the federal government stands up and says, no, you rebelled against our country. You fought against us. There is no way in this world we're going to honor you with that sacrifice. The dead. Though, the dead. Kind of, when was the first Arkansas? Uh, 1872, Fayetteville formed, uh, and theirs was called the Southern Memorial Association, but it was a, an LMA formed in 1872 dedicated their cemetery the following year in 1873 and somewhere in my notes I can tell you exactly when they they dedicated their first monument in the 1890s at some point um, speaking on uh, back to the dead mm -hmm. what did the um, did your research show that maybe the southern women were a bit more noble and when they found Union soldiers instead of what did they do? Uh, both sides are filled with, if you read northern newspapers or southern newspapers at this time, they're both claiming that the enemy is grinding up the bones to use for fertilizer, or they're, um, you, they're turning in the heads of Yankees. Because keep in mind, for many of these, literally the remains that are left are skulls and what they call large bones, meaning the femur, or any arm or leg bones. That's all you have to turn in to account for one body. And so there are rumors that are circulating, and that's in part what then leads to, I hate to use the word repatriation, but that's in some ways what it was, the Gettysburg dead. Gettysburg Cemetery is dedicated in 63, the fall of 63. Thousands and thousands of Confederate dead were left on the field then. And so in 1870 through about 1874, the Southern Memorial Associations all across the South hire Gettysburg officials to disinter the soldiers and send them south to be buried in, in Confederate cemeteries in the south because they had been left where they were on the field. And so part of what fueled that were all of these rumors about what one side did to the remains of the other. And this is something, we like to think that the Civil War was over and reconciliation and brotherly love and union happened all at once there in the parlor of the McLean House in Appomattox. That absolutely was not the case and the dead was one of the biggest issues. How do we treat the dead? It was one of the, the most poignant and divisive issues following the war. Yes, sir. Yes, do they have anything comparable to graves registration? They can identify who, who was buried where, who was buried where, and the, and wherever they were, is that? The yeah, yes, sir. And that's what's part of what started in the post war period. For places like Andersonville, Clara Barton is instrumental in burying the dead or identifying as many dead as could be at Andersonville Prison creating the National Cemetery there. She kept the, record the records for, for the burial, and then it would go to the federal government. So if you were a family member looking for the grave of your son, you could write to Graves Administration, and they could tell you where, if he had been identified, where he was buried. The Ladies Memorial Association take on this <coughs> same role in the South. You write to them. So they're, they're acting as a bureaucracy of sorts, because there's no Confederate agency to do this work, and so they're acting in the same manner. And in fact, they would sell copies of their booklets to raise money that, that listed the names of uh, people buried in, in various cemeteries. Joe? Could you, following on that question, could you talk a little bit about your sources? I just finished Drew Gilpin Fast's ah, book. wonderful. In which she's talking about um, largely union sources mm -hmm. and the fact that, that uh, union um, commanders were ordered at one point to keep right. a list of soldiers and what happened to them. Right. Not only to write the proverbial letter, but also to essentially keep an inventory. For right, and that starts different. during the war. But it became increasingly hard as the war went on to even keep the sketchiest of records. Right. And, and she's writing about that very issue, mm -hmm. uh, nascent bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. And so, by comparison, what's on the southern side for the ladies? Nothing. Well, during during the war, for the Confederate Army, there's nothing like the burial corps. There, there's no equivalent. There is no effort by the Confederate government to set aside land or to even require commanders 
to create cemeteries on the field if they're created there by members of a local of a local company or a regiment who do so and whoever commands the field after a battle is going to be the one the dead from the the winning side is going to get the best treatment on the battlefield others are going to be buried in mass graves but the confederate government never has a provision the way the u.s federal government does and following what you were asking about my sources in terms of the so what do the ladies have to work with? Nothing to begin with. And that's part of the reason that they, they saw this as their job. Because mourning had been very much feminized by the mid-19th century. This was something that women were expected to do. They were expected to dress the body. They were expected to perform all of the, the mourning customs that surrounded. I mean, the 19th century was full of all sorts of rituals that you were expected to perform. It becomes increasingly difficult during the war, even wearing black becomes difficult when every family around you. Verena Davis, for example, when her son dies in the Confederate White House, is torn as to whether she should wear black, wear mourning, because they simply don't have the resources in order to do so. But most of the sources that I looked at, all of the associations that I examine, except for Winchester, the minutes of the ladies were available. They're handwritten minutes from 1866 on. And so I used their words. I used correspondence that were sent to them. The Museum of the Confederacy, I don't know how many of you all have followed this in the New York Times and Washington Post as of late. The Museum of the Confederacy in Richmond, Virginia is an outgrowth of the Hollywood Memorial Association. And so all of their records are there. The museum is being shut down because the Medical College of Virginia is growing around it and you literally can't even get to it anymore. But the association member are records, all the correspondence, everything is there. Newspapers added to this. So I had their words for the most part. Dr. Lewis, do you have a question? Um, yeah, uh, a couple. My, my first question has to do with uh, the husbands of the wives of the Memorial Association who mm -hmm. said that they were you know, sort of upper class, a lot of professional people. Mm -hmm. Do you know how many of those men um, paid replacements? Oh, I don't. But that's a, a fantastic question. I would guess many of them did. I'm, many I'm of them did. If there's an element of guilt in that would make absolute, absolute sense. Most of the men tended to be, I, I didn't find very many who sat idly by. They were some sort of public administrator where they were the mayor of the town or involved in the Confederate government or a minister. But there must have been. There must have been substitutes that were paid. There's no doubt about that. My second question has to do with what, what does it tell us about gender that the women are founding memorial associations to help bury the dead, while a lot of the Southern men, uh, leaders especially, um, were involved in um, trying to preserve the battlefields. That doesn't happen until much later. That has, doesn't happen until the 1890s, the battlefield preservation movement. Gettysburg <coughs> happens immediately. It happens in the summer of 1863, but that's a union control, that's a union effort until the federal government takes over in 1893 with, with Gettysburg. But it's all part and parcel of the same thing in the end. The movements come together. Men come out of the woodwork. In 1870, Reconstruction is officially over in Virginia, as it is in many other places. And men come pouring out of the woodwork. They say, thank you, ladies, very much. We appreciate all the work you've done. We can take it from here. Women don't need to be leading this cause. And the women of the ladies say, that's all right. We've, we've done our part, and we like this new position of not necessarily authority, but influence. They found a new role for themselves, a role that had been denied them because Southern white women couldn't be involved in the women's rights movement because it was so intimately connected with abolitionism. And so here's a new role. Here's a new way for women to be politicized in the South that's acceptable, it's socially acceptable because it looks socially conservative. Annie? One of the things that one of my friends, I had to get off the phone, I said, I've got to go hear the lecture today. And so she asked me, what was it about? And she said, why are you going to find mm. out something about the Confederacy? <laughs> well, my answer to her is that you will never have, quote, peace unless you have an understanding of the environment at the time that those people were the leaders of a cause that they felt very sincere about. Mm -hmm. And that when you truly continue to follow history, you will find that ultimate if we all know the histories, that's right. We will have a united history, and we can all 
feel that everybody wants to contribute, whether at one time yours was negative or whether one time it was perceived as positive. And that's why I'm a history buff. I have to know all of it before I can come to a conclusion that I don't know. No person is just right or no person is just right. wrong. So that's why I came to hear you. Thank you. The whole history. Thank you very much. Sure. Approximately how many of these cemeteries were established? Direct how far did this go? Approximately how many cemeteries? Mm -hmm. Hundreds. 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 So in every state? Every state. Every state, the, the one in Fayetteville would have buried the dead from Prairie Grove and Pea Ridge. Is Any there dead? A of all of the. And, and Not that I know of. They are, say, in Arkansas. Not that I know of, but that should be something. I mean, you could probably to Google, Google Confederate Cemetery and you'll get, yeah. get a list. I mean, it, the proximity to battlefields, the, the closer you get to, to battlefields, which means that's why Virginia is so full of them. Every small community has a Confederate cemetery. Sue in Judge Sonia, Arkansas, the cemetery in Judge Sonia. What about in Helena? There is a, uh, there is a, there's a, there's a, there's a monument to Union soldiers. It's the only one outside of, of uh, the, the official cemeteries in the Judge Sonia city. But it was done, these were, these were Union soldiers who died after the war. Mm -hmm. that are buried, but there, it's the only Arkansas memorial outside the cemeteries, uh, the veteran cemeteries, to Union. So if you're ever driving through Judd Sonia, go to the Judd Sonia, see it's the biggest memorial at the cemetery. I went by it the other day. One more time, one more question. Yes, we've got one more question right here. Since the Union soldiers were mostly Thank you.